So hello everyone this is Tanjila this side from Exchange for Media today we have Neha the CMO of Pizza Hut and the Pizza Hut is also by the way one of my favorite pizza brands um so I stay in Andheri and fun public mein bahut acha aap logo ka ek uh, you know this this place to go and have fun really and I really enjoy the pizza over there so when when the opportunity came to me I told my editor that I want to talk to her <laughs> About you know what is going on, what is the thing? So yeah, and uh, today we have Neha with us. She will talk to us about Pizza Hut, the ideas, the the thing, the innovation that you guys are you know bringing in into the brand, and you know how you are planning out for the Indian consumers and the evolving Indian consumer for Gen Zs like me, where I am having, I am seeing and reading a lot of conversation on LinkedIn saying that you know uh, marketers are not able to get. people like me and i'm really not understanding so let's let's uh, get into it and uh, we'll we'll surely talk about everything i hope uh, first of all my question to you neha is that pizza hut is a legacy brand if i am not wrong the brand was established in the year 1958 right yes globally that so yes globally yeah so could you please uh, and in 1998 the the day the the year that i was born in it was established in india so yes. could you please talk to us about how the brand has evolved over the years surely i think uh, you know as you rightly said pizza hut is a legacy brand uh, you know even by the time it came to india globally it was already a very well renowned uh, trusted brand right um if i focus on our journey in india uh, we were clearly you know one of the first few qsrs to come into the country right um and i would say the first uh, probably 15 years right our focus was largely on creating ourselves as an experience brand right um like you spoke you know very fondly of your current experiences in pizza hut uh, when we talk to people who are not gen z like you a lot of people <laughs> talk about first dates at pizza hut a lot of people talk about birthday parties at pizza hut so for the first 15 years in the country i would say the brand was more about I won't. I wouldn't reduce it to saying just a dine-in brand. It was an experience brand. Uh, you walked into the brand and you you felt something. Uh, you know better when you walked out of the brand, right? Uh, and that was really the focus. That was and and from the beginning, our focus was on giving craveable, tasty food. Uh, that has continued to be, I would say, hallmark to the Pizza Hut experience, which is craveable food. But over the last um, decade, I would say there has definitely been a conscious movement. towards trying to become more um, hmr as we call it internally which is home meal replacement uh, you can you know okay. that is the terminology we use internally for delivery or for take away because basically both these channels are leading you to replace a home meal with uh, you know with with our uh, with our food right um, our focus did definitely pivot towards it and i think in the last 3 years simply because of covid uh, that that pace of pivoting has accelerated very very strongly uh, so if you look at the 25 year period one is just the pivot as far as channels are concerned and how the brand has evolved right but i think some things have also remained the same uh, and what when when i talk of remaining the same i think things like the way we maintain brand standard brand quality the craveability of our food uh, right all of those things continue to remain uh, core to our experience at pizza hut whatever channel you access us from uh, but i would say really over the last 25 years if i look at how the brand has evolved in the country uh, i would say these are a couple of ways that the brand has kind of changed and evolved wow that's amazing it's just so much good to hear legacy brands talk about their journey like from the era of say uh, radio to the era of meta and all right. so how you guys are you know doing so we'll, we'll talk about that in the next few questions yeah. so i would say that during the pandemic like these two years that we have faced uh, the food and the hospitality sector was impacted like anything like they were shut people were not people were losing their job there were so many things that was going on i mean but at that time also pizza hut was still uh, you know i could see that you guys are functioning properly so what was your mantra to sail through this this uh, difficulty period that we had sure. difficult period that we had i think you know the first thing is and i will go back to how you started the conversation saying we are a legacy brand i think what comes with a legacy brand is that your foundation is extremely strong extremely extremely solid 
you do not have to wait for a covid to get your uh, trust with the consumer tested or to get your brand standards re-evaluated because you're already operating at extremely high standards, right? So I think if you ask me during yeah. that time, what mantra did we adopt? I think it was to just stay our course and continue to do our jobs. That is actually what we did, right? If I look at store teams, they continue to go out there. They continue to make fantastic pizzas for all of you, right? Yes, we had to, uh, as you know, the market kept evolving and we also all started understanding COVID better. Uh, we had to go into things like contactless deliveries and some things which we could not have ever imagined in this category we had to go into. But I think what was important for us as a brand was our foundation was so rock solid that we were able to adapt very flexibly and in an agile manner to some of the changes that were happening. I think if we had suddenly had to make all these changes in one go, if our foundation was not strong, that would have been far, far harder to do. I give a lot of credit to the way our franchisees held ground, the way they managed the teams. It was not an easy time for anybody, right? And at the same time, at a brand yeah. level, Tanzila, what we actually did was that we, we focused almost from the beginning on the fact that quarantine can actually be looked at differently it's time quality time for you with your family right so one of the first campaigns we ran uh, when we just went into quarantine and we didn't know how long it was going to last was we said it's quality time not quarantine right uh, and again it's oh. peaky, uh, but it goes well with what we are about as a brand right I spoke about it right in the uh, start about us being a brand about experiences right and during that time we yeah. felt that families were coming closer together while there was a lot of stuff happening, but there was definitely a silver lining to look at. And, and I think as a brand, from a marketing perspective, we tried to somewhere focus on, on some of those things, right? I think the last piece also is around when there's such a tough situation happening around you, are you as a brand listening to what the consumer wants, right? Very, very important. And what we felt at the time was the consumer wants ease, the consumer wants ease of accessibility. The consumer wants ease of technology. Uh, the consumer doesn't want to have to now, he has enough tough decisions to make in the rest of his life. He has enough uncertainty in the rest of his life. He wants something comfortable to go back to, right? And as a brand, I think that is what we, we try to do for consumers, whether it was when you walked into our store or whether it was the delivery experience you had. Um, if my pizza could bring a smile on your face, why not? That's, that's amazing. So I mean, if you could, you know, um, you know, elaborate on the things that you did at that time, like uh, you said that your uh, delivery uh, thing got, you know, expanded and what all things that you did during that period in order to, you know, intact the business. Sure. I think the biggest one for us was the pivot to delivery, right? Uh, to have a, 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 a store that is now instead of doing 50, 60 percent dine in business, suddenly pivoting to delivery means that operationally you have to change things, right? You'll have to ride, add riders mm -hmm. to the team. You will have to have that entire ecosystem mm -hmm. set up for delivery. That was the first thing we did. We started building the ecosystem mm -hmm. for delivery. We started hiring riders. Wow. We started looking at how that ecosystem can be built as soon as possible. The second piece was just technology in itself, right? We started, we, we always had a Pizza Hut app, even at that point of time we did, but we realized that we needed a bit of a makeover, if I may say so, even on the app. So we've actually launched a new app early this year because we felt that we needed to upgrade our own technology experience for the consumer because this was another piece that was, people were more, more on the phone than ever before, right? The, set, the third yeah. thing was the media perspective. Um, you, you spoke about it, you know, radio to meta, what has changed, right? <laughs> I think during yeah. COVID, what also happened was that you were consuming everything on your phone. And therefore, what we started doing as a brand was that we literally shifted, I would say, almost 100% of our spends on digital, right? To make sure that we were oh, where wow. you were as a consumer, you know? We were talking to you where yeah. you to be sort of uh, spoken to, right? Um, the other thing we did was that, like I said, we already were following very strong standard operating procedures. But the point is, you may not have known yeah. about it, right? So we dialed up the communication yeah. Yeah. as far as, you know, building what we called trust in every bite. So we dialed up that communication yeah. because we felt this was a time that consumers um, had heightened, you know, sort of issues with hygiene, with with quality and things like that 
since we were very confident about our own quality uh, standards, we thought it was time to dial up the communication around it. So that was the other thing we did. So apart from all the work we were doing, we also dialed up communication on, uh, you know, uh, trust in every bite. The last piece that we did, um, and frankly, while this is a, this is something that QSR does do, which is value, right? We try and offer consumers good value when they walk into our stores or when they access us in delivery. Yeah. But during COVID, I think what we we did, in my opinion, very smartly, was that we realized that because people were home, large group sizes, which were not seen earlier, were suddenly happening, right? So when you go to office and you order from office, you're typically ordering for yourself, right? So it'll be a one person, two person group size. Therefore, the value I offer you is very different. But if you're at home now suddenly and you've become a family of four or family of six, again, you know, a lot of people went back to their hometowns. A lot of people were um, going back to living with parents and so on and so forth. So group sizes increased. We took this as an as an opportunity for us to provide consumers abundant value, as we call it. So value was the other vector that we worked on, uh, whether it was on core value, uh, where we offered pizzas. We have a deal called One Plus One we launched during that time, end of 2020. Uh, we also, uh, you know, made our hut treat, which is our one of our very signature deals, hut treat for four uh, again, uh, made, made that sort of come to the fore so that consumers were able to get what they want uh, because we believe we needed to change the way that we were also looking at our business uh, since the environment around us had changed. Amazing. So, I mean, uh, if you could just tell me that, uh, what is the percentage of your, like, what is what is the percentage of your business is into the dining and what is the percentage of your business is into, you know, delivery and takeout, etc., etc., right now? Sure. So if you look at it broadly, about 70-75% of our business is now coming in from delivery and takeaway. Um, and and dine-in is about uh, the remaining. So it's about 25-30%. to 30%. Uh, So that is a tables significant... Have turned. Sorry? <laughs> so tables have turned. Right. Tables. So before the pandemic, it was ulta. Now it is totally different. I really love uh, talking to legacy brands and these brands. You know, how are you guys change with the changing times and you know it's just amazing hearing all these stories and all these initiatives that you guys take and yeah so talking about the evolving time um and the time that we are living in so as i said that i have been hearing a lot of conversation about marketers really finding it difficult to understand gen z and really you know cutting to the cohort and uh you know delivering them what they want so, I mean, uh, can you, are you able to, you know, as a brand, are you able to track the Gen Z's? Are you able to, you know, uh, cater to them and provide them what they want? So, have we been able to crack Gen Z? I, I don't think anybody can say they have cracked Gen Z because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the Gen Z by themselves, I think, are... Um, you know, in a way, um, you know, they have multiple personalities in one, right? It happens because I think the Gen Z today is a is a very different person. I don't think the Gen Z themselves knows what they are going to be one week from today and two weeks from today, right? So cracking the Gen Z, I think, is 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 not something I would claim to have done. But I must say the one thing that has helped us, if I may say, cater to Gen Z, which, which I would say is a better way to put it from, from our perspective, you have to remember we have stores. We have stores that yeah. customers walk into every day, right? Um, and I worked a long time in the in the FMCG category before this. You call something a moment of truth, right? Uh, you, you may observe a consumer at a modern trade store purchasing a product. However, in our case, that moment of truth, imagine that a consumer walks into your store and easy spends an hour, hour and a half at your store, right? Um, that is a lot of consumer insight sitting in front of you, right? So I think the first thing... Uh, that we have done and that we have, we have done in a very uh, continuous manner is that we have, through the pandemic, uh, made sure that our insight team was honing for more insights, looking for more insights, right? Because like I said, I believe that Gen Z is also evolving along with, you know, the world evolving, right? So what I may believe of you today may not be true of your own beliefs six beliefs six months from today, right? So I think that's the first thing that are we going after wanting to genuinely understand Gen Z, uh, you know, over quarters, over years, right? The second thing I think is that as a marketer today, it is very important to say, I don't know. 
I don't know, you tell me. I think I would be very uncomfortable as a marketer saying this 15 years ago because it was expected that we knew everything. We knew better than you what you wanted, right? I think today it is a partnership in learning. I engage with the Gen, Gen Z, they feed me back and then I build more, right? So just to give you a small example, right? Uh, when we launched one of our most popular, I would say today popular products, which is called Flavor Fun. It's an entry level product, but it's really a more for less sort of a product. You cannot believe that you're getting this sort of a range, this sort of a pizza at this price point, right? When we launched it, uh, we, we, ran a, we ran an interesting activation with Friendship Day. And we basically said, you know, Friendship Day, you can actually give a gift card to your friend for just 79 rupees, which was the price of uh, our starting price point for the Flavor Fun Pizza. Uh, just thanking them for something silly, you know? So that friend who like never returns your phone calls, you know, and then today has picked up your phone, right? So silly things like that, you know, you, you kind of gift them 79 rupee gift card. It did very well for us, okay? What that taught us, so what Gen Z told me was, you get me to interact with you in an authentic way. I will then make, I will create engagement, I will create virality, I will do all that for you, but make it fun for me, make it authentic for me. So what we have done with that is, so just, I don't know if you know, but today is something called Singles Day, uh, the 11th of November. And it's a, it's an event that I would, as a brand, I, I don't think in any brand I've worked for, including Pizza Hut, we've ever participated in. But we realized with the kind of, um, you know, like I'm saying, feedback we got on some of these activations that we did, that this is again an opportunity that we think that Gen Z would respond to. And lo and behold, last two days, we've been activating this um, on social media and we're doing some stuff in stores today. Again, it's doing very well for us. So I think with, with Gen Z, what is important is to listen. Let them feed back to you what they are liking, what they're not liking. But you have to listen for that. I think single day is going to be a huge hit. Because everybody <laughs> wants single day. It's fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really intrigued by the statement that you made that, you know, you have to listen to the Gen Z's in order to understand, understand them. And I think a lot of marketers are not able to sort of, you know, um, understand this point of view only in the first place. So yeah, uh, we are at a crunch of time, so let me just, uh, you know, quick the, con I mean, uh, pick up the conversation. Uh, sure. You spoke about technology a lot, right? And uh, you have been working in, in, in the technology of the brand um, from COVID time, because it was that time where you want to nudge or you want to touch the consumer where they are, right? Uh, as as you said, the you know, the mobile phones they were they were trying to you know they were they were spending most of their time you know scrolling or watching content or whatever. So you know, martech marketing technology has become a very popular term because of you know these trends that you have seen in the consumer, right? right. So I mean, what are the different elements that you guys are uh, that you are bringing into connecting your audiences with, with uh, you know? actually you know getting uh, into their psyche and understanding what they want and you know catering to them so could you please tell me at least the three elements that you are bringing into the technology side of your brand in order to you know touch the consumer where they are sure sure i'll, I'll talk about a few of them i think the first piece is our app itself right um, as i mentioned we've launched a new app uh, you know earlier this year in in quarter one of the year, um, I think that is really Pizza Hut in your pocket, right? Because it's important to, um, to, to have a way that I know that my consumer is only talking to me when he has the Pizza Hut app. I'm able to provide better value for him. I'm able to understand him or her better to be able to provide a better service. So I think the first one uh, that we've gone after quite maniacally, I should say, um, is the app, app right? Um, it's already, uh, it, it, it's been about six months since we launched it. And, uh, you know, the downloads have been stupendous, giving us feedback from the consumer again, that it's working, right? Uh, that people are liking the new experience we have created for them. Uh, and they want to come back to us more often for it. So I would say that's the first piece. The second piece is we are very, we're very committed as an organization towards uh, what, you call marketing technology, right? Um, I think while some of these are buzzwords, right? What happens is that unless you actually put them into practice, they only remain buzzwords. How we have put it into practice is that we actually have a calendar. You know, every marketing person has a calendar. It's a very 
common practice, right? But what we have started doing actually from the time COVID hit us is we have a mark tech calendar. So for example, along with our technology folks, if I know that there is a certain intervention that the technology team is giving me, let's take an example of, uh, you know, providing me with more kind of variety of coupons, right? Which let's say was a technology capability I did not have. If I know that is going to come in April, I actually build a campaign around that. And therefore, both technology and marketing teams are working together to really achieve the mark tech calendar and not just marketing going in its own direction while sort of technology, uh, you know, as in when it fits in, it fits in. It isn't like that. It's a very planned, thought through thing that we do in the beginning of the year. We've been consistently doing it for three years now. I believe that that has also helped us um, in the in the way that we operate, we think technology, every marketing person thinks technology and every technology person is thinking marketing, which is great, right? Um, and I think just the last piece is that for us, again, as an organization, we don't think of only technology in terms of the front end application that you're using, right? Because that's the most obvious, I would say, way, way of using technology. But we're also looking into how we can make our back of house experience more efficient, so that we can provide you either your pizzas faster, either your pizzas hotter, so on and so forth. But also things like in our dining part of the estate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a concept called BYOD, which is called bring your own oh. device, right? So basically you may have experienced wow. in some restaurants where you can use your phone while you're at the restaurant to place an order at the restaurant. So uh, yeah. requires little or no uh, interaction with the staff, right? You're also yeah. left to your own decision-making because sometimes you know, you want to just enjoy yourself fooling around, adding this, removing this. Then somebody on the table says, oh, I forgot this. Why don't we add this? So on and so forth, right? Yeah. So that is another experience that we have created. It's getting rolled out as we speak, uh, probably should be across the estate in the next about six months or so. So we are looking at technology yeah. in all aspects of our, how it is hitting you, right? And while you ask me for three, I have another one, which is the fourth one. Uh, which as a marketer we have extensively used, which is really the digital landscape of media, right? It has yeah. evolved yeah. tremendously. One of the things that we do, yeah. and again, this comes from the belief that things change too fast. We ensure that we spend at least 5 to 10% of our media budgets on something experimentative or something innovative within the digital space, right? Okay. And I think that has held us in good stead. Some of those experiments bomb, but some of those exper experiments have actually told us here is something to use in your next campaign, probably spend 20% of your spends towards it in your next campaign, right? So I would say these are some of the ways that we have we have gone about our approach to technology or to digital. Uh, and again, both these words are used, so I'm, I'm using both, uh, you know, just to make my point more evident. But these are things that we have really worked on. Now. Okay. Amazing. So, um, if you could tell me about the recent exp experiments that you have done. So, from a media perspective, I think, um, I mean, there are there are lots of experiments, but I think probably, um, le let me talk to two of them. Um, I think the first one is just around how digital radio has been working for us, right? Um, we have, we have looked at... Um, I mean, radio has obviously been a channel for the longest time, right? Uh, but the way that the savans of the world have um, kind of taken over the the hearing space of this of, of, of Gen Z, uh, when we started experimenting with them, and now I'm talking 2020, uh, you know, they were again a very small part of our budget, right? But over the over the years now, we've added Spotify also to it. We have added how we operate with them. For example, for Flavor Fund, the, the campaign I was talking to you about, which is the 79 rupee product. We didn't just put ads on it and didn't just, you know, do the regular kind of advertising. We actually created a playlist on Spotify, right? We created a playlist for uh, oh, the Flavor Fund just to, you know, make it more enjoyable, make it more interesting. Um, so we are, we are experimenting either with a new platform or sometimes just doing a plus plus on the platforms we're already operating in, right? Um, the second one that uh, possibly I, I can talk to is, if you look at, uh, I would not call it probably an experiment for the market in the sense that these have been around for a while, but for us, I think it is definitely something more new. See, initially we always had this thought that consumer will come, and I'm talking as a marketer, not just in Pizza Hut in general, the consumer will come to my store, the consumer will come to my brand app the consumer will come to the aggregator so on and so forth right 
But now we are also coming to a conclusion that we have to go where the consumer is, right? Um, which means that if let's say you use, uh, you know, any of these payment apps, right? Whether it's phone pay, Paytm, Google Pay, etc. Now they have also become platforms which actually are platforms that you can do everything on, right? Are we present there or not? Uh, was a question we asked ourselves. And that is, again, a journey we started. Uh, we'll be ensuring we are in more places as we go along. But that was, again, something that we experimented. We started last year with phone pay. And hopefully, in the next quarter or two quarters, you should see us moving into things like Paytm, etc. Um, so these are just some of the examples I have to share. I am very happy listening to this because, uh, you know, these days, I there is a trend going on that these platforms like phone pay, or even e-commerce platforms are becoming um, a part of brands, you know, putting themselves towards uh, in front of the audiences. So I have yeah. just two more questions sure. and then to us. It's like one four right now and then it will take only five minutes more. No problem. So how, uh, uh, you please tell me that how is a Pizza Hut harnessing the reach and popularity of digital to drive footfalls and, you know, brand recall? One of the one of the pointers that was shared. So I, I think uh, I, I mean I answered that question in saying that uh, yeah, we yeah. are at ninety percent. See, when you are spending yeah. ninety percent of your spends on digital, basically that is the only source that we are using for brand awareness at this point yeah. in time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we are we are not only using digital for performance marketing, which is the most obvious one, which drives people to our online platforms but actually all our campaigns whether it is you know momo mia which was a which was a campaign that was obviously meant to have pan channel uh, reach all of this brand awareness has yeah. been digital we've only used uh, digital for brand awareness and what we found is that um, with advertising on and, and the good thing is we use a we use an organization called quantum to do media modeling for us so we are aware that when we spend mm -hmm. money somewhere what does that what channel does that spend have an impact on and what that is clearly telling me is that mm -hmm. when you actually spend on digital you have pan channel impact so mm -hmm. spending on digital helps you get people mm -hmm. into your stores it helps you get people on aggregators so interestingly enough that while you may imagine that when you see a brand ad you will walk into the store or you will go onto the pizza hut app However, if you're used to ordering via an aggregator as a habit, you will see a Pizza Hut app and pro ad and probably go and open up Zomato or Swiggy and order Pizza Hut from there. So uh, we have seen all of those correlations happening and which is why we continue to be a, a digital only brand. We have just started some experimentation with TV back again, uh, simply because we believe that now some normalcy has come in in terms of, you know, COVID having abated. Uh, and so in the spirit of experimentation, again, it's funny to say experimenting with TV because, you know, TV was the, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm finding it funny even as I'm saying it, but that's really what, what we are doing now because we've become so digital heavy. We're actually saying yeah. experiment with TV and see if we want to start making some uh, inroads back there. So my last uh, second question to you, Neha, is that, you know, um, during the pandemic or even before the pandemic and right now also, there are so many homegrown brands that have come in place and, you know, brands which are vegan, brands which which, which sort of have a different all together uh, yeah. look and feel. And I also, while researching and, you know, writing this question, I was also researching that whether Pizza Hut has a vegan sort of option or not and thankfully you guys have a vegan option considering the times that we are living in and everyone is woke and they want to you know go into veganism which is fairly fine right now so how you are cutting through the cohort of these homegrown brands who are promising the 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 touch of uh, you know say personalization that a brand uh, that a consumer wants so I think, you know, the good thing, Tanzila, in the last couple of years, especially, is that there has been enough market created for everybody to exist, right? I think uh, the consumer frequency has gone up quite dramatically of eating out, of eating pizza, both. They have gone up dramatically. And therefore, I believe that the homegrown bands have a role to play in certain cities, certain pockets, right? But we are a brand of scale. We are 700 plus stores, right? And therefore, my responsibility to my consumers is to be able to provide a, an experience to you in Bombay that you get in Delhi, that you also get in Calcutta, right? That is my responsibility as a brand. So I think homegrown bands have a 
different objective with which they operate because they are homegrown because they are small much much smaller in scale they can do a lot of things like like you said personalization or even more innovation on their products etc but i think the challenge for us is that we must do stuff which of course firstly is spot on brand because that's not something i would play around with but also something that can talk to scale right and and that's i think also the charm of working for large scale brands is that finding those products like a momo mia uh, you know which which we launched last year um, it actually did well all across but if you were to just ask anybody else that hey are momos popular in the south versus in the north they probably say what's more popular in the north it's there in every street corner it's not as much in popular culture right but the momo mia pizza did well everywhere right so i think that is our challenge to figure out what are the what is if i may say the lowest common denominator but yet innovative yet unique to be able to put out there for us homegrown brands are more than welcome because i think they help encourage the overall category to grow it helps encourage people to eat out more eat in more but to increase their occasions we have not found that our occasions have reduced because these occasions have gone up so i think it's you know it's a big market there's room for everyone okay amazing so my last question to you is that what is your plan for the indian market in the coming year or say the coming um, you know the times that we are living in what is the plan for the indian market and the trend that you are seeing in the indian consumers so it's we are very aggressive we are very bullish about this market um, if you look at our journey over this the last 3 years you will see that we have actually put words uh, put put our actions where our words were right uh, both our partners our franchisees uh, you know went into an ipo in in 2021 uh, and what that means is that they are ready and raring to go to put more stores um, down right at this point last year we were at 500 stores today we are at 700 plus stores uh we've added 80 new cities in the last couple of years since 2020 we're going to soon be in 200 cities right so if i look at the horizon uh, over the next 3 to 5 year period i see us continuing to be on a on a very very agile and fast growth path uh, not just from number of stores and number of cities that we expand into but each store itself um is is really giving us far better top lines than it was right uh, because of all the actions we're taking so as an organization along with our franchisees we're extremely bullish about the next couple of years for pizza hut amazing thank you very much neha for taking out time and having this fun conversation about you know everything around the brand and as well as the evolving times and uh, you know genji's uh, single day etc etc it was fun talking to you if this interview doesn't come out as a video we'll surely have a fun chat you know where you know <laughs> my questions will be shorter and my questions sure. will be more on the funnier side cool sure. have a very great day and thank, thank you, you everyone for being here for thank you thank you, you tanzil it was a pleasure talking to you thank you, thank you.